It's lovely to have Phil Dunn back with us this morning from European Missionary Fellowship. Uh, we've had Phil before, and he, he always comes with a great deal of information uh, that helps us whenever we think about praying for the work of the Lord in Europe. So we look forward very much to hearing from what you, to what you'll be saying to us a little later, uh, Phil. We're going to begin our service as we sing our opening prayers. When I was lost, you came and rescued me, reached down into the pit and lifted me. O oh Lord, such love, I was as far as you, from you as I could be. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we realize that we were in that pit of our sins, and we want to thank You that in Your love and mercy and grace, You reached down into that, and You lifted us up, and You put our feet on a rock, and You established our going and put a new song in our mouths, even praise to our God. And Lord, we thank You that we have that opportunity today to express the reason why we are glad, the reason why we are happy and at peace within our hearts, and that is because of what Jesus has done in us, not because of what we could do, not because of our own goodness, not because of who we are, not because of what anyone else has done to us, but Lord, it is because of what You have done in our hearts through the death of Your Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, that You have taken away the punishment that we deserve for our sins, and You have brought us near to You. We rejoice in that this morning, and we also rejoice in those who are sharing this great news of the gospel with others. We thank You for the work of EMF. We praise You for how the missionaries throughout Europe are, are seeking to take that truth and to share it with others. And Lord, we realize that it is so much more difficult at the minute because of COVID. 
We thank You that these missionaries have found new ways and means of, of taking the same message to the lost. We ask that they would see fruit for their labor. We pray that they would see many in these days of uncertainty come, coming and trusting in the One who is the rock, the One who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank You for Phil here. We thank You for how You use him as he goes out around many different congregations. And we pray that as he seeks to encourage people in the work of EMF, that he would see many coming on board, supporting prayerfully and financially and physically in, in going and telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we think particularly of France and Belgium. We're aware that, that in those countries, the number of evangelicals is about 1 or 1.2 percent, and Lord, we, we realize that the need of the gospel there is great in these days. So, we pray for those who are seeking to share Christ in those circumstances. We think of Spain, and we realize that there is a need for, for the, uh, the Spanish Christians who have come to faith to choose to share their faith with others to take on the responsibility of ministry. And we pray, Lord, that we would see that in the days that lie ahead as well. Lord, we bring Europe to You today, and we ask that You would pour out Your blessing upon Europe. We pray that You would use those who are Your people, Your Christians in Europe, as they would seek to make their faith relevant to others. Lord, we pray that through these opportunities, that we would see Your kingdom built up in these days. And Lord, we pray for our own area here. We pray for Ahokal. We pray for Galgorm. We pray, Lord, for Balamina. And we ask that we would see people in these days coming and trusting in the Savior, that for those of us who are Your children, that we would take our faith seriously, that we would understand our need to be faithful to You, that, Lord, we would have a desire to grow and deepen in our knowledge of You, and that we would become increasingly holy as we are shaped and molded by You. So, Lord, hear our prayers now. Answer them according to Your will as we offer them in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to ask Phil if he would now come and speak to the boys and girls. Thank you, Phil. Good morning, everyone. It is great to be here with you. Thank you so much for the invitation, for the warm welcome. Isn't it great to be back in church again? I know there's all the restrictions and limitations, but it's so good to be out amongst God's people enjoying fellowship again. So thank you for having me along. Now, boys and girls, I wonder what you would like to be whenever you grow up. What kind of job would you like to do? Uh, maybe it would be a, a doctor, or a vet, or a policeman, or an astronaut. I always wanted to be a footballer, but at age 40, I think that's not going to happen now. Well, this morning, I want to tell you about someone who had a great job. In fact, I think this is one of the best jobs in the world. Now, this person with this great job is not someone you're going to know. In fact, I bet your mums and dads, grannies and grandas won't know this person either because he lived a long time ago, about a hundred years ago or so. His name was James Stewart. James Stewart. And James Stewart is one of my heroes. Do you know why? Because he was a missionary. He was a missionary. That was his job. Does anyone know what a missionary is or does? Have a little think. Well, I'll tell you, a missionary is someone who goes to tell other people in other places all about the Lord Jesus. See, boys and girls, there are loads of people in other parts of the world who don't know anything about Jesus. Maybe they don't have church, don't have Sunday school, don't have pastors, don't have Christian parents, and they don't know anything about Jesus, but God has a great plan. He wants His people to go tell those people to trust and follow Jesus, and that's what missionaries 
do. There's a really important verse in the Bible, one of my favorites. I wonder if you read this one before, where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. That's found in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. In other words, go and make followers of Jesus from all over the world. And that's what missionaries do. So it's a great job, but you know what? Being a missionary, boys and girls, is also a really hard job. Take my hero, James Stewart, for example. James wanted to go to a country called Latvia, and he wanted to tell people there about the Lord Jesus. Now, do you know what some people thought whenever he told them he wanted to go to this strange place called Latvia? They thought, don't be so silly, James. Sure, Latvia? Where is that? That's so far away. Why would you go there? And they were kind of right. Have a little look at the map. James was from Scotland, and he had to travel the whole way across over to Eastern Europe. Some other people thought, don't be so silly, James. Sure, you don't even know the language that people in Latvia speak. And again, they were right. James only knew English. Didn't know Latvian. Some other people thought, don't be so silly, James. Sure, you're far too young to go and be a missionary. And again, they had a point. James was just in his early 20s, a young man. But James knew God had called him to be a missionary. So way back in 1934, he set off, and it was a long journey. In fact, it was so long, so difficult, that when he finally reached Latvia, and he was getting off the final old rickety train, he was so exhausted, he was so unwell and so cold, that the first thing he did was to stumble and faint at the side of the train station. That's not a very good start, is it? And maybe you're thinking, well, all those people who advised James to stay, maybe they were right after all. Well, after a while, James started to feel better, and eventually he started traveling all over Latvia, preaching the good news, telling people that if they trusted in Jesus, if they believed that he died for their sins, God would forgive them. And you know what happened next? Something amazing. God started to save Latvian men, women, boys, and girls from their sins. Now, not just one or two people, that would have been great, but loads of people. Over and over again, hundreds and hundreds of people would crowd into these big buildings. There's a picture, you can just see it. All the people crammed in. They weren't really doing much social distancing in those days, were they? Desperate to hear the good news of the Lord Jesus. Many of them for the first time. Many of them trusting and following Jesus. In fact, God blessed James so much that a few years later, a group of people called European Mission Fellowship started. And today... We help loads of missionaries all over Europe tell people about Jesus. Isn't that brilliant? Aren't missionary stories great? Why not find out some more stories about other missionaries? You could ask your mom or dad or maybe your Sunday school teacher or your pastor here to help you. In fact, you could find out about missionaries who are alive today and you could start to pray for them. Why not pick one missionary and decide to pray for them every night before bed? Wouldn't that be a great idea? And who knows, if you're a Christian, and you've got to be a Christian, maybe one day God will call you to be a missionary. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Remember what Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. Thank you, Mark. Just to make a few announcements at this stage, uh, first of all, to say once the service is finished, uh, I know you're well 
accustomed to this by now, but just remain in your seats until somebody from committee comes and ushers you away. We would appreciate that very much. Um, I know over the past wee while we haven't been able to have our usual evening services between the three Presbyterian churches in Ahokal, but can I encourage you, um, perhaps even at the time when you normally would have that evening service, why not listen to either the service from Trinity or Brookside uh, on the internet? You can pick them up through their own websites or through YouTube um, or um, through Facebook, so take the opportunity uh, to do that. Youth Fellowship this evening will be online. It's the small groups tonight. I can see where Steve's sitting. Yeah, Kirsty can tell me. I didn't have to look as far as Steve. Uh, so it's the small groups tonight uh, online. Uh, then Tuesday evening at half past seven, we have our missionary prayer time and committee meeting. And that will be in the choir room. Am I right? Yes, Ian's nodding his head. Uh, then on Wednesday evening, we have the third of our Disciplines of a Godly Man series. Um, we'll be looking this week at uh, how a godly husband and a godly boyfriend should be. So um, if you fit into that group, um, or you don't fit into that group, but you want to be in that group, come along on Wednesday evening. We had a great turnout the last evening, so please do come along this week at eight o'clock. Everyone's welcome to that. You don't have to be a member of First of Huckle, but everybody's welcome to come along to that. Then on Saturday uh, evening, uh, John Hill and James Turtle's prayer cells will be meeting from seven to eight, and can I encourage you to remember to bring your masks along with you. Then Sunday evening, uh, or next Sunday morning, I should say, Sunday school and Bible class will be operating from a quarter to 11 through to a quarter past 11. Uh, next Sunday also will be our harvest service. Uh, things will be a little bit different, but a little bit the same. And if you want to see what that means, then do come along uh, next Sunday morning uh, at uh, half past 11. Uh, then our youth fellowship will be meeting uh, in the building next Sunday evening in the Stamish Suite at 8 p.m. And as far as I can tell, that is all the announcements. We're going to join again to praise God. Uh, this time we do sing, before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. And after this, Phil will come and address us. <laughs>
Aren't those beautiful words? That's one of my favorite hymns. I love the lyrics. Can I perhaps just sneak in one of my own little announcements concerning our online EMF conference, which is coming up very soon on Saturday, the 21st of November, um, from 3 to 5 p.m. We're going to send you out one of these little leaflets in due course. The theme is the message and the medium sharing the gospel in an online world. This is one of the biggest challenges we're facing, isn't it? How do we share the gospel when so much that we used to do, we can no longer do? Visiting people, knocking on doors, giving them leaflets. What can we do online? What are the opportunities? What are the pitfalls? We're going to explore that on Saturday, the 21st of November. We've got some special speakers, John Stevens, the FIEC National Director, Pastor Andrew Roycroft from Malayal Baptist, and then two of our missionaries, Vitaly Mariash from Ukraine, and Stefano and Jenny Mariotti from Italy. So please keep an eye out for that on our website. We'll send you a little leaflet as well, which maybe you can pin up somewhere, and we'd love for you to join in. I'm going to read one portion from God's Word, one that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn with me to John chapter 14, verses 1 to 7. John 14, verses 1 to 7. And you'll see why I've chosen this particular passage as we go through the presentation. John 14, verse 1, this is God's Word. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going." Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. We'll pause our reading there at verse 7. Now, as a mission, we are supporting over 90 faithful gospel workers spread across 16 desperately needy European countries. Perhaps it's worthwhile right at the start just to remind ourselves that according to Operation World, the percentage of evangelical Christians in Europe today stands at 2.5%. If that's correct, and we believe it is, it means that Europe is officially the least evangelical continent on earth. Isn't that sobering? And what I want to do this morning, just for a short time, is to zoom in on one country that we're working in and one couple that we're supporting there. So, this morning we're off to the beautiful land of Italy. Italy has been described as the birthplace of Western civilization. And for good reason. This, remember, was the land of the mighty Roman Empire. This was the cradle of the Renaissance. This was a culture which flourished for centuries. It was home to some of the world's most notable military leaders, artists, explorers, theologians, and philosophers. I wonder, has anyone been to Italy? Pop up your hands, have you been? Yeah, quite a number of us. Maybe if you've been, you've visited some of these places, some of the world's most iconic landmarks. There's the Colosseum, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, the Roman Forum. And of course, it's classical villas, the Mediterranean coast, the Northern Alps. These are just glimpses of the breathtaking beauty which draw millions of tourists every year. Not so much this year, of course. 
So Italy is a fascinating country, awash with rich, colorful history, filled with spectacular scenery, and it's home to over 60 million charming, warm-hearted, and passionate people. But sadly, friends, Italy is also a land shrouded in deep spiritual darkness. And this dreadful spiritual darkness has continued for centuries. Indeed, we often think of the mighty 16th century Reformation, that great heritage of ours in Europe, led by Martin Luther and others. Sadly, unlike many other European countries, the Reformation did not penetrate Italy. It stopped at the Alps. And since that time, brothers and sisters, Italy has never experienced any major spiritual revival. So that's the rather bleak background. That's the history. But what's the spiritual situation like in Italy today? Well, one religion continues to dominate. It is, of course, Roman Catholicism. Rome remains the headquarters of the 1.2 billion strong Catholic Church. The current pope and head of the Roman Church, Pope Francis, he continues to govern and lead from there. And it's fair to say Roman Catholicism continues to have a powerful presence in almost every city, every town, every village across the land. In fact, over 80% of Italians identify as Roman Catholic. It's a huge percentage, isn't it? In other words, of the 61 million people living in Italy today, almost 50 million are Roman Catholic. And yet, the striking fact is this, friends. It appears that Catholicism in Italy is struggling. It seems many Italians have become disillusioned by Roman Catholicism. For them, religion is irrelevant. It's outdated. It's insignificant. And that's especially true for the new, younger generation of Italians emerging. The vast majority of them see Catholicism as part of their cultural identity rather than a personal belief. And so in reality, like so many other parts of Europe today, spiritual indifference in Italy is everywhere. However, it's also true that having lost faith in the Catholic Church, millions of Italians are looking for answers elsewhere. But they're looking in all the wrong places. So, for example, Islam is now the second religion in Italy at almost 4%. Still other Italians are turning instead to Eastern mysticism, other forms of New Age practices. Have a look at this. This is remarkable. In contrast to approximately 50,000 Roman Catholic priests, there are now in Italy 150,000 practicing soothsayers, faith healers, and fortune tellers. Isn't that incredible? That is paganism, pure and simple. So, put all of this together then, and you are left with a tragic picture. Because whether it's faith in a false religion, or spiritual indifference, or the pursuit of some paganistic form of belief, the result is the same. Millions of Italians are cut off from God, slaves to their sin, and consequently destined for hell. This is the plight of the great, beautiful land of Italy. Next question. Well, what about evangelical Christianity in Italy? How is that faring? Friends, the sad reality is this, that only around 1% of Italians are evangelical. 
Indeed, many of the remaining 99% may not even know a single Bible-believing Christian. So I hope I've convinced you Italy really is one massively needy mission field. Now, let's zoom the camera in a little more because I want to introduce you then to one of the national couples that we are supporting in Italy. That's one of the features of EMF. We tend to support mainly national workers, people uh, in their own countries who know the language, the culture, the people. Here we have Antonio and Anna de Noia. Antonio and Anna de Noia, a really lovely couple. And I would say Antonio is one of EMF's most distinctive missionaries. Uh, he was a professional chef for over 30 years, something I should not have told my wife before he came to stay with us for a week. Can you imagine the panicking? He also rises at 4.30 every morning, spends two hours studying, and then goes off for his five-mile run, after which he comes home and starts working. When he was across staying with us, he very kindly invited me out on his early morning run, and you guessed it, I very politely declined. Before I tell you about his ministry, I really want to tell you about his conversion because he's got a wonderful story of salvation that I think will encourage you. Antonio was born and raised in a Roman Catholic family. And being very religious, very devout, from an early age, his desire was to become a priest. And as he grew up, he continued to attend church regularly. He paid in his money. He prayed to Mary and the saints. He belonged to a brotherhood. He was constantly going to confession. And yet, the sense of his sin tormented him. The thought of divine justice terrified him because he had no peace, no assurance, no way of knowing whether he would one day go to heaven or purgatory or hell. And so in turmoil, he began to pester his priest for a Bible so that he could read it, study it for himself, to be sure that he was indeed right with God. But each time he asked, the priest would reply, no, Antonio, you cannot have a Bible because you would not understand it. You must just listen to me. Trust what I tell you and everything will be okay. So the years passed. Uh, but in the early 1980s, something remarkable happened. One day, Antonio was out looking after his father's sheep. His father was a farmer, and he decided to have a break. So there he is, walking across into town, um, passing across the shops, going across the road, minding his own business, when out of nowhere, a stranger, a man from Sicily, suddenly stopped his car the edge of the road, wound down his window, held out his hand, which contained a bag of oranges and a few gospel tracts. Now remember, Antonio has never set eyes on this man before. This man has never set eyes on Antonio before. But suddenly he has what he's been longing for, portions of God's Word. Isn't that marvelous? Two complete strangers meeting in exactly the right place at exactly the right time with exactly the right material. Some people will say, well, wasn't that good luck? Chance occurring. No, no. We know this was God's doing, wasn't it? And it was one verse which totally transformed Antonio's life. It was John 14, verse 6. The one we read where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. This one verse changed everything. Antonio realized that his salvation did not depend upon the church. It did not depend upon the sacraments. It did not depend upon the saints. And it did not depend upon Mary. 
No, according to God's word, salvation was through Jesus Christ alone. And so in simple faith, he cried out to God, confessed his sin, and put all of his hope, all of his confidence on the work of Jesus on the cross for him. And he was born again, and he was so happy. And he returned home to share this wonderful news with his parents. And the first thing his father did was to look at him and say, out, you are no longer my son. He looked to his mother. She said the same. He then returned home to his wife. By this time, he and Anna had two children with another one on the way. But she couldn't accept his conversion either. Remember, in Italy, the evangelical faith is often thought of as a kind of cult or sect. And so Anna left him. And for two whole years, they were separated, and he wasn't allowed to see his children. Can you imagine that? He was completely disowned. He was totally alone, but the Lord stood by him. The time passed. The days turned to months, the months to years, but still God was at work. And slowly but surely, his mom and his wife, Anna, their hearts began to soften. Until one day, his mom phoned him up and said, please, Antonio, would you come over and read some verses from the Bible to me? Well, as you can imagine, Antonio was thrilled, set off straight away, sat down beside her, opened up his Bible, and turned to one verse. Can you guess what it was? John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And guess what? His mom believed. Not long after that, Anna, his wife, also believed, and they were reunited and a little while later, his dad also came to trust in Christ. There's his mom and dad. His dad's now gone to be with the Lord in glory. But it doesn't stop there, because 20 years later, Antonio's daughter believed. Then his other daughter, and finally, his son. Household salvation. Isn't that a remarkable story? And isn't it a reminder to you and I that God can break into the lives of the most unlikely people in the most unlikely ways? Remember how it all started with a stranger, a bag of oranges, and a few old gospel tracts. Doesn't that encourage you to use every opportunity you can to speak a word for Jesus? You never know how God might use it. And there is Antonio and the stranger from Sicily, now brothers in the Lord. You know, maybe this morning you have a loved one who is, spiritually speaking, nowhere near the Lord. And it looks utterly hopeless. Remember this story. Remember, God can break into your family. God is mighty to save. The gospel is still the power of God unto salvation. Let me exhort you, keep praying. Keep witnessing. Keep sharing the good news. Keep praying. Keep trusting. With our God, all things are possible. Well, that's a little bit about Antonio's life. Let me shift the focus very quickly onto his ministry because he's serving the Lord in wonderful ways. He is a pastor, he's a church planter, and he's an author. And here's where they live and minister. Antonio and Anna, they're in the town of Pescici. And Pescici is a stunningly beautiful little town right on the edge of the Adriatic coast. Doesn't that look nice? Doesn't that put you in the mood for a nice holiday? pity we can't. The scenery, the beaches, the quaint narrow streets mean in normal times tourists would flock here from all over the world. In the summer months, the numbers of people coming into this little town would be a hundred thousand people. It's a great place to share the gospel. 
And that's what Antonio has been doing. In fact, it was as a result of his personal evangelistic efforts that a little group of believers began to meet together in the town. And in 1992, a church was formed, and Antonio became its pastor the following year. And he continues there, the same church, preaching, pastoring, witnessing, serving the Lord with tremendous zeal and faithfulness. Now, that little church in Pescachi began with just six believers, humble beginnings. Today, there are meeting some 30 believers. No, it's not a massive church, is it? But friends, it's there. And they are united. And they're committed to the preaching of the gospel. But you know, once a church planter, always a church planter, And so a number of years ago, Antonio began working in two other towns, trying to spearhead some kind of gospel work there too. So he started holding home Bible studies in a little uh, town called Vico, which is about 10 miles further inland, a place with no gospel witness at all. Today, praise the Lord, there's a church with some 25 believers. More recently, he's been working in another town called Vieste, about 15 miles on down the coast. Previously, again, a place in complete spiritual darkness. Today, praise the Lord, there's a little church with some 15 believers. Doesn't that thrill your heart? Doesn't that encourage you? Praise God for his so great salvation. Praise God for these three little flickering gospel lights in the midst of tremendous darkness. Would you pray for them? Humanly speaking, they're very small, very humble, and they're very vulnerable. Pray that God would give them grace to grow in strength, in courage, in boldness, and that through the preaching of God's Word, many more might be added to their number. Well, Antonio does have an important writing ministry. I'm not going to take time to share about that because I do want to tell you about, despite all of his efforts, Antonio was also a full-time carer for his wife, Anna. Over the years, Anna has struggled with very serious depression. In fact, there were numerous occasions when it was so severe that she had to be admitted to hospital. But sadly, in more recent times, Anna has also been diagnosed with bone cancer. This, as you can imagine, was a terrible blow for them. It's a very painful kind of cancer. Anna now struggles even with basic mobility. And so Antonio will take her to the hospital regularly so she can receive treatment. And it's worth remembering that in Italy, there's no NHS, so a lot of this medication has to be paid for, meaning there's financial pressure here as well. Now, thankfully, over the last year, Anna's depression has lifted. For that, we're rejoicing. Would you pray that God would keep the depression at bay? And would you pray that she and Antonio would have grace and strength to get through each day with her cancer? It is not easy. It's a heavy burden. But you know what? The Lord is with them. And they are full of the joy of the Lord despite the difficulties. Brothers and sisters, we're looking for people to get behind Antonio and Anna, to really pray for them, to really support them, perhaps even financially. You could take one of these little leaflets. Uh, They're not available this morning, but you can email me or contact me through uh, Mark, and we can send you those to be prayerful. You can be put on their prayer letter list. You can support them financially. Again, let me know. We could send you a little standing order form. Give a small amount each month. Or perhaps even as a church, you could consider developing a partnership with Antonio and Anna. Really get to know them in particular. Maybe send over teams in due course. Pray for them. Have them pray for you. All kinds of possibilities. Please do whatever you can do and help us to keep reaching Italy, to keep reaching Europe with the gospel. Thank you so much for another opportunity to tell you about what God is doing through our work.
We're going to conclude by singing our closing piece, Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. You became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I've wondered at your gift of love, and I'm in that place once again, and we'll stand and sing. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen.